the Holocaust Memorial Week at Oregon State University and in the Corvallis community. We're very pleased to have him with us. He's been doing double duty by speaking today and, uh, to students in, in their classes. We've had excellent reports and we look forward to, to his lecture tonight. I'll tell you at the beginning that he has agreed to take a few questions afterwards, so we hope that uh, you'll be able to remain uh, and ask him any questions about his talk that, that occurred to you. He currently teaches at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. His master's in 1968 and his PhD in 1975 from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, following a bachelor's degree at Oberlin College in 1967. He was a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow to Israel in 1989. Uh, before that, he had so many honors to his credit, including the best award from the German, the best article award from the German Studies Association in 1988, named a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, 1984-85, and was an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation fellow in 1980-81. He's the author of two books already published, Faithful Months, Essays on the Emergence of the Final Solution, and The Final Solution and the German Foreign Office, 1940-43. He's the author of numerous articles in English, German, and French professional journals. And a couple of items of interest, he took part in a filmed interview on former SS Colonel Walter Ruff for a 30-minute documentary produced for Grenada TV's World in Action in Manchester, England in July of 1983. Walter Ruff was responsible for the development and production of the Nazi gas van in which at least 200,000 people were murdered. Ruff died in Santiago, Chile in May of 1984. More recently, looking at last year's sabbatical that I mentioned, uh, he was contracted as editor and the primary author of The Final Solution, a five to seven hundred page book on Nazi Jewish policy during the Second World War as part of Yad Vashem's projected 24 volume comprehensive history of the Holocaust, now writing the chapters in 1942. He's a man of varied experiences and uh, an expert who is here to talk to us further tonight about the Holocaust. Uh, we, we welcome very warmly Professor Christopher Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Massive study, which was 
the preeminent uh, synthesis of perpetrator history, which is still the unequal uh, volume in this field, saw the Holocaust basically as a vast administrative bureaucratic process carried out by hundreds of anonymous bureaucrats, officials, engaged in doing all sorts of kinds of activities of which the final solution, participation in various uh, acts of discrimination and persecution of the European Jews, was usually only one facet. Uh, and that this wide-reaching bureaucratic network that Hilbert analyzed, he referred to as the machinery of destruction. That basically the whole structure of the German government uh, was harnessed to this operation, that in terms of the personnel, as he said, the perpetrators were a cross-section of German society, basically selected at random. The notion of criminals as a kind of special asocial element within society simply didn't fit the reality of how the Holocaust was carried out. Uh, Han Arndt, looking at Eichmann uh, in the docket of Jerusalem, uh, came up with another metaphor, another slogan. Hilbert talked about the machinery of destruction. Han Arndt talked about the banality of evil. That the real dilemma in trying to understand the Holocaust was this vast discrepancy between the non-entities that carried it out on the one hand and the almost unimaginable scale of destruction on the other. That the chasm between these two, this total inequality between perpetrator and crime, could only be bridged by the notion of the banality of evil. That evil had become, in a sense, so ordinary, that the people carried out in so many ways were basically ordinary people that you couldn't uh, see them as a special kind of group or a special kind of criminal. Uh, generally, this idea of the bureaucratic crime, the Holocaust as a bureaucratic administrative process carried out by this army of faceless administrators has stood the test of time. This really hasn't been fundamentally altered, it hasn't been fundamentally re revised in the 30 years since Gilbert and Arndt basically shaped uh, our understanding of it. Uh, and while it has been refined, I think that aspect of, of perpetrator history uh, is still more or less in place. German courts trying to come to grips with the perpetrators of the Holocaust in the end found themselves dealing with this kind of group that they had to have a, a special word for. The Germans came up with the concept of the desk murderer. The person who sat behind his desk, filled out forms, drafted telegrams, initial memoranda, who never saw a Jew, never struck a Jew, never pulled a trigger, never committed an act of overt physical violence, and yet made the whole process work. And without that fundamental contribution of coordination, of bureaucratic, administrative, harnessing of all the sources of the German regime and population to a mass murder program, the Holocaust as we know it simply would not have taken place. Uh, what we know increasingly is that virtually every government institution in Germany, virtually every party organization in Germany, developed a cadre of Jewish experts. After the Nazis came to power, suddenly the existence of Jews in Germany is now a matter of public policy. And you have something that's a matter of public policy, which you begin to get as a whole series of official experts that have to deal with that. And that very quickly after 1933, almost instinctively, virtually every ministry of the German government and every organization of the party built up a cadre of Jewish experts so that whenever new legislation was proposed, the input of that ministry, the interest of that organization could be represented in her, in her, or you know, across ministerial conferences and so forth, and that they could protect their turf, they could have their interests represented and advocated. So that by 1939, there was already, in a sense, a whole cadre of Jewish experts in place, basically people whose nine to five job included doing things against Jews, thinking up things to do to the Jews of Germany, and of course after 1939 against the Jews of the rest of Europe as well. This is a fairly shadowy, anonymous group. We don't know a lot about most of these people. They were a relatively faceless uh, collection. One group we know a great deal about because I wrote my PhD dissertation on them. This was the Jewish
Jewish experts of the German Foreign Office to just give us a sense of who the death murderer is, how did he operate, how did he become involved. I'd like to introduce these people to you, give you a feel for what the death murderer in the Holocaust is. The Jewish death or the Jewish referat, the youth referat, the German Jewish death in the Foreign Office had a head to it, and it's from Ladebacher, and over the three years that this particular bureau was in existence in the period that I looked at it, uh, he went through a sequence of three assistants. They picked their four major figures that one has to look at. What can we say about the collective? They were all born between 1901 and 1911. That means that they were between 30 and 40 years old in 1941 when the mass murder of European Jewry began. They all went to the university. They all pursued the study of law. These are lawyers turned bureaucrats. They all joined the Nazi party between March and May of 1933. They are all bandwagon Nazis who wanted to further their bureaucratic career, took that first step of joining the Nazi party as soon as it looked like the Nazis were there to stay, to get in as quickly as possible. On the other hand, none of them was ever in the SS. These are not black-shirted stormtroopers. These are bureaucrats. Uh, none of them, before they got their job in the Jewish desk in the Foreign Office, was in any way prominently involved in anti-Semitic activities, had any particular anti-Semitic background. Uh, that they all came into this Jewish desk really through a series of rather fortuitous events. They happened to be available when the job was open. They happened to have the right kinds of connections. Uh, that is, really was a series of personal accidents, one might say, that these people ended up uh, in the Jewish desk of the German foreign office. In terms of how they reacted to this position, uh, in fact, they reacted very different. Two of these four people, once they were in, were very enthusiastic to become the best Jewish experts they could possibly be, to be self-made anti-Semites. Franz Rademacher, the head, for instance, as soon as he gets this job, gets himself a Jewish apartment in Berlin, begins to write all sorts of anti-Semitic publishers, to build up an anti-Semitic library, hobnob with editors on Julius Streicher's Der Sturmer, this obscene anti-Semitic newspaper of the Nazi regime, tries to ingratiate himself with, to gain legitimacy with, the professional anti-Semites of the Nazi movement. Uh, likewise, uh, his last assistant, a man named Fritz Gebert von Hahn uh, had been uh, in the military, wounded in the Netherlands in 1940, very severely, was recuperating uh, for quite some time, wanted to get back into the civil service career, uh, and so asked if there was part-time work he could do in the foreign office while he was still on health leave from the military, uh, was sent to the Jewish desk because there was an opening, and thereafter basically spent every period of convalescence when he could get out of the hospital doing things that he didn't have to. He was on vacation. He comes to work there in order to increase his credentials, establish uh, his enthusiastic record as best he can. The other two, in fact, tried to get out as soon as they could. Uh, the first, a man named Herbert Mueller, uh, was brought in because he had missed an appointment. He was going to be sent to Bulgaria. Sick, he missed that, and so he was then brought into the Jewish desk uh, as soon as he came back. There was an opening there. He pulled all the strings he could to get drafted into the army. In fact, uh, was uh, sent uh, from the foreign office into the military, was eventually wounded in North Africa. Another came back from South America, and the embassies there were closed in the spring of 1942. Again, through connections, was brought into the Jewish desk. He too tried to get out and in fact was able to get a posting uh, to a very cushy job at that time, a posting to Switzerland, which almost anyone in Germany with the bombs falling would have found to be one of the most ideal uh, postings that one could get. The interesting thing is that despite the very different subjective reactions of the two people who were enthusiastic about what they did, the two people who wanted to get out as soon as they could, in objective terms, when one looks at the memoranda they wrote, 
when one looks at the way in which they function in their job, you can make almost no distinction. They all function as meticulous, conscientious bureaucrats who wanted to make sure that their record was clean, who wanted to make sure they had the proper recommendations about how well they had done their job. And so that, in fact, subjective attitudes to the job made very little difference at all, as long as they were concerned to do the job as best they could while they were there. It really didn't matter whether they liked what they were doing or not. That in the end, even those trying to get out participated in and contributed to the murder of European Jewry. For instance, we have Herbert Mueller, one of the first that I talked about, already knowing he's going into the army, already with his rap papers in his pocket. I uh, is handed a, a memorandum from the legal division in the Foreign Office, uh, basically saying that there is an inquiry uh, from a organization in Portugal that wants to send uh, food supplies to the Lodge Ghetto. Uh, is this or is this not uh, within policy? Uh, should there be a, a conference within the Foreign Office to debate this issue? And you're right back, as I say, days before he's about to leave, he didn't have to do this. The Jewish desk asked that the question of permitting aid shipments from abroad not be clarified in an individual meeting. The planned final solution for the European Jewish question, known to you, does not permit that food shipments be made from abroad to Jews in Germany or in the general government. Uh, and then he quickly leaves. These are the kinds of memoranda that one finds uh, the trail, paper trail that these desk murders leave behind. Uh, these desk murders did their job conscientiously. As I said, basically their subjective feelings had very little to do with how well the job was done. They, as problem solvers, saw it as their duty to solve all the kinds of local difficulties that fell within their jurisdiction uh, and that it was their ability to remove various kinds of potential problems, or to dismiss inquiries of this sort that helped, in fact, to make the machinery of, of destruction run as smoothly as it did. We know, in fact, bureaucracies have the capacity uh, to sabotage almost any government they wish to sabotage. Uh, but what's unique about the bureaucracy of the German government uh, is not that it obstructed the policy of mass murder, but how it, in fact, facilitated its very smooth and all too efficient operations. These people at the lowest level, however, were not the ones that made major policy. They smoothed out the glitches at the bottom. They solved the minor kinds of problems that emerged. They could not make the kinds of decisions that would bring the Foreign Office into active participation in the murder program in the first place. Those bigger kinds of decisions had to come from above. And there we need a different kind of figure. The person that was key, for instance, in the German Foreign Office was an Undersecretary of State named Martin Luther. Uh, that name, since I teach at Pacific Lutheran University, caused some distress when I first applied for a job there. Uh, and they wondered, who in the world are you talking about? And it turned out that this Martin Luther called himself the great reformer of the German Foreign Office was going to reform it in proper <coughs> style. In any case, Luther was a strange figure. One must understand the German Foreign Office was the elite of the elite, the very top and most prestigious element of the German ministerial bureaucracy. It had in its ranks basically the Count of so-and-so and the Freiherr of so-and-so, generations of aristocrats that uh, held down the position. Martin Luther is quite something else. He never completed high school. In 1914, when World War I broke out, he left before even getting a high school diploma, went and actually operated as a logistics person uh, behind the lines for four years. When the war was over, he did not go back to finish his education. He became a businessman, tried to construct uh, transportation businesses, furniture removal, supply, hauling, went bankrupt a time or two. But by 1930, in fact, was economically on his feet and a relatively successful small businessman. As such, he joined the Nazi Party in 1932, went around collecting charity funds for the Nazi Party in a suburb of Berlin, and happened to ring the doorbell of Ribbentrop, who was Hitler's foreign policy advisor at this time. He quickly ingratiated himself with the Ribbentrop 
family, providing all sorts of things necessary for remodeling their home, keeping them up with uh, the most current uh, styles in terms of interior decoration uh, and these kinds of things. When Ribbentrop went to London in 1936 as the new German ambassador, Ribbentrop wanted to redecorate the German embassy in proper Nazi monumental style, and so he took his interior decorator with him, Martin Luther. Luther, within the next two years, was able to transform that personal service to Ribbentrop into a political career. When Ribbentrop becomes foreign minister in 1938, Luther, in fact, talks his way into a transfer into the foreign office as well, uh, something that, of course, the old-timers and old guard there viewed with uh, great disgust, that this uh, interwoven <coughs> from the outside uh, of vulgar uh, lower class, or basically lower middle class small businessmen uh, should be crashing the gates of the prestigious foreign office because the city was quite appalling to them. But Luther makes himself indispensable to Ribbentrop as his political invite. We know increasingly that internally in the Nazi system it was a kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world of jungle war, bureaucratic imperialism uh, that each uh, of the various followers of Hitler trying to edge out the other for the Fuhrer's favor, and that anyone who hoped to prosper in that highly competitive system of kind of institutional Darwinism had to have good political insiders to cover their tail, and that is basically what Luther did for Ribbentrop. By 1941, he has risen to the rank of Undersecretary of State, kind of unheard of career uh, for someone of his background, uh, and had reached a position of considerable influence, and basically brought under his domain, his jurisdiction in the Foreign Office, a whole panoply of activities, including, among others, uh, the Jewish death. Luther is not particularly interested in Jewish policy up until 1941, but he is interested in power. He is interested in protecting the jurisdiction of the Foreign Office because that is what makes him vital and important to Ribbentrop. When Luther perceived in 1941 that Jewish policy has taken a fatal turn, that Jews are being killed in Russia, that plans are afoot to kill Jews in the rest of Europe, Luther's instinctive reaction is that Jews are to be killed the Foreign Office is going to help out. We are going to have a piece of the action. Because it is only, in fact, by contributing to such programs that the Foreign Office ensures its jurisdiction in the various allied and satellite countries of Europe will not be encroached upon by the SS. And it doesn't take any order from above. There is no order that comes to Luther or to Ribbentrop to take part in a mass murder program. He instinctively understands what is needed. He goes to Heiden, the first deputy. He makes the initiatives. He attends the Von Say conference. For those of you who saw the movie, Luther is one of the figures in that uh, who meets privately afterwards with uh, Heiden and Heiden in that small group. He is the one that basically brings the Foreign Office into a full-time participation in the program of deportation and mass murder. Uh, this dynamic of a bureaucracy that developed basically to conduct the foreign policy of, of the regime in which the Nazis increasingly encroached upon, becoming in fact participants in the mass murder program, uh, may seem strange at first glance. But the more I looked at the dynamic of what had taken place and the kinds of personnel involved, the less unusual it was. I was doing this research in the German Foreign Office in Bonn, in their archives, in the early 1970s. And I would go and work in the day in the German Foreign Office, and I would come home at night and read the Herald Review about Watergate. And let me tell you that, in fact, some of the parallels were extraordinarily striking. What did we have in Watergate? We had a group of people, John Bean, Jeff Stewart Computer, Eagle Crow, all in their 30s, all university, law school graduates, all people that went into a civil service career, all people who, in Jeff Stewart Computer's terms, were good team players. Let me tell you, team players emerged in every bureaucracy, and they were in Nazi Germany, and they were in Nixon's administration in the 1970s. People who were going to make a career in good, clean record in order to prosper. People like that, however, don't make policy from above. They make sure that the policy runs once it's been made. Where do the initiatives come from? Who are the people that, in a sense, engage the wheels of the bureaucratic process? Well, we know 
so did the fact that Nixon had around him a whole collection of what I would call the political hatchet men. If the Foreign Office had Martin Luther, Nixon had Mitchell, Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Colson. These people did not need orders. There was no point at which Nixon had to turn to these people and say, you do this, you do that, I want this kind of dirty tricks here, I want that primary campaign sabotage, I want this person's character to be smirched. All he has to do is say, there's going to be no surprises in this campaign, will there be? Uh, they're going, we're going to win this election, aren't we? And everybody else then understands what's expected, and they start to compete with one another. We know that in fact there wasn't a concerted dirty tricks campaign. All of these people opened their own shop. They each trying to say who could do it better than the other. Uh, and that the whole political dynamic, in fact, and the profile of the perpetrators, of the desk criminals, was not at all different between the gang in Nixon's Watergate affair and the Jewish experts of the German Foreign Office in the final solution. Fortunately, Nixon only wanted to convert American democracy and not carry out mass murder, but the dynamic was not different. In any case, as I said, we, we have learned more of the details, but the basic concept of the death murder, the basic understanding, I think has remained intact over the last 30 years, has been a historical contribution by Hilberg that is in fact likely to remain intact. What we haven't done so well is to go step below that, or in fact to go several steps below that, to look at the grassroots killers, the people at the bottom who were engaged in day-to-day -day direct confrontation in a repetitive, endless manner of killing their victims. We know some about some of their commanders. For instance, the most notorious of these, of course, the Einbachruppen. These were the mobile firing squads sent into the Soviet Union in June of 1941, became the spearhead of the assault upon Russian Jewry, carried out, uh, organized, and led the massacre such as at Bobby Yar and elsewhere. We do know something about the officers. Some of the top officers were tried at Nuremberg and others were tried later. Uh, but in fact, we know almost nothing about the rank and file of these units. Uh, the man, uh, Dr. Hans Heinrich Wilhelm, Berlin, who has written a major study of, of one of these kinds of groups, and of the A, who worked in the Baltic, has said in his work, I can't give you a profile of the rank and file. We don't have the material. We didn't have a list of names. The officers we can recover, the rank and file, we don't. So that in this most notorious case, we simply cannot recreate or write a history of the rank and file killers. We cannot even get you a profile terms of social background, age, occupation, or whatever. We know what areas they were recruited because we have this to say so many border police, so many security police, so many drivers, and so forth, but we do not have the individuals. In terms of recent research that I was doing for the, the volumes I mentioned, particularly uh, dealing with ghetto theory in Poland in 1942, however, I came across an extraordinary collection of interrogations uh, for a particular unit that can allow us to ask some of the questions and answer some of the questions that we have not been able to ask before. When I was looking at the whole operation of ghetto clearing in Poland, what I was trying to get at was, was basically the, the, the tremendous logistical achievement, negative achievement to be sure, an incredible achievement in which basically the Nazis deported killed 8 to 90 percent of Polish Jewry in a brief 11 month period from March of 1942 to February of 1943. This was another blitzkrieg. This was a lightning war to finish off the Polish ghettos. It was a major operation. You're talking about more than a million and a half people that were either shot or deported uh, during this period in the general government alone, central part of Poland. And I asked myself, where did they get the personnel? The spring of 42 to February of 43 is the time from the launching of the second German offensive to Stalingrad. These are the 11 months in which the fate of Germany hangs in the military balance. Where did they get the people to do this? And as I looked into the, to it more closely, it became clear that they had not diverted any military sources. That when Himmler went to Poland and told the SS 
the Watchman got were about 100 euthanasia personnel from Germany to form the expert for the death camp personnel. But beyond that 100 men, she basically was given nothing at all. But Watchman had to build private armies and to create ad hoc forces, private armies to carry out his war on the Polish ghettos. He got the manpower from that from two sources. One was that he went into the Russian prisoner of war camps and recruited people from the borderlands of Russia, particularly Ukrainians, but maybe from Latvians, uh, and they were sent to a special training camp called Tramiti, and they were organized into units. Some of these men were sent to the death camps. A camp like the Lincoln would have 30 Germans and 120 Ukrainians or whatever. Usually these people outnumbered the Germans four to one in a camp of that sort, very small personnel. But much more important was the personnel he needed to clear the ghettos, to drive people onto the train. And for that, he had a number of companies and Tramiki of these people, and they formed the Tramiki men, formed one major component of the ghetto clearing army. The other part of the ghetto clearing army was the order police. This is a unit we didn't know a great deal about. Uh, that we knew a lot about the security force, which included, of course, the Gestapo, the most notorious branch. The police, they were basically a combination of political police and FBI. But this border police was a vast conglomeration of city cops, county troopers, your ordinary police were all subsumed under what is known as the border police. Uh, but they weren't particularly politically grouped, and they never were viewed as a kind of hardcore Nazi organization. In fact, the order police uh, before the war for uh, you as a kind of inferior branch of the police. Any really gun ho Nazi got into the security place. Uh, most of the SS was in the police went into that area, but the order police was a kind of uh, second cousin uh, and one not with the same kinds of prestige. <coughs> Before the war, the order police not only were composed of the, of the city cops and the county troopers, they also began to form battalion-sized paramilitary formations. Some of the order police were organized into 500-man battalions, given rifles, and given forms of military training. These were units that were then sent into Poland in, after 1939 as behind-the-line security. Who was going to round up all the troops, loops that hadn't been captured, round up all of the scant military equipment and so forth? Basically, that was left to the order police. What was in this order? Well, in the order police, on the one hand, you had people who wanted to become professional police officers. All those that wanted a career as police were in the order police. A second source, interestingly enough, increasingly in 1938-39, were those that wanted to evade service in the German army. If you got into the order police, you were exempt from the draft. It was kind of like a National Guard unit. Well, we know from our present vice president that gun ho patriotism and service in the National Guard are not uh, on the other hand, I think that, that for many of these, they went into the order of police because they saw a war coming and they didn't want to be in the trenches as the cannon fodder of the next war. So it's a kind of strange mixture uh, that is in the order of police at this time. Once the war begins, the order of police has to be vastly expanded. Uh, and an agreement is reached between the, basically the order of police and the army. Uh, that the army will not draft people out of the order police if they're given a certain segment to begin with, as long as thereafter the order police only take older men. And so that the order police, in a sense, is allowed to conscript men who are too old for the German army, people that the German army isn't even interested in anymore. And so what happens is they create, they, they expand the order police drastically. By the mid 1940s, there are a quarter of a million people in the German order police. Most of them draftees, middle-aged, family men, too old for service in the German army, that are put into what is now called reserve police battalions. And the pre-war people, which is to say the professional policemen and the draft debaters, are turned into the non-commissioned officer cadres of these massive expanded reserve police battalions. And it is these reserve police battalions that are sent to Poland as behind-the-line security, and it is these order police, reserve order police battalions that become the second major component of uh, the Wachnik's private army for the 
warmth of the Polish ghettos. I studied one of these battalions, and I'd like to tell you something about it, or at least about it. This is Reserve Police Battalion 101. It comes from Hamburg. These were light National Guard units were locally organized. And again, if you went into that, you had the prospect that you would be stationed near home, you wouldn't be sent off elsewhere. So it is a local unit. Uh, Hamburg, in fact, had raised four police battalions. This was the number 101. In terms of its officers, it was headed by a 53-year-old major, a man named Wilhelm Trump. He was a Myanmar policeman. He had risen to the ranks. Uh, and uh, coming out of the ranks, had a very good rapport with his men. He was known as Papa Trump, referred to him in a very affectionate manner. The battalion was divided into three companies. Two of these companies were headed by captains, and these were the two young career SS men in the officer group of this battalion. These were men in their late 20s, people who had been Hitler youth, Hitler Nazi student group, uh, then immediately into the party in the SS in 33, had gone into police training, now held SS rank as well as order police rank. These were hardcore career SS men uh, in their late 20s. The other officers in this battalion were reserved lieutenants. Basically, they were middle-aged men who were drafted into the police, but because of their background, they had more education, they had been successful in business, they were thought to be officer material, were sent off to do the officer training or commission as reserve lieutenants sometime between 1939 and 1941. Of the seven reserve lieutenants, five were party members. Only one of them, however, had early party membership. The rest were rather belated joiners in 1937, 38, 39. Not untypical, the typical middle class German of their age. Of the non-commissioned officers, we know 25. Only 11 of those 25 had not the party membership. Only four of that 25 were in the SS. Their average age was 32. These are men who had joined the order police before the war. Of the rank and file, nearly 500 men, about 60% were working class in that. They had typical unskilled working class jobs. Dock workers, warehouse workers, truck drivers, seamen, waiters, uh, in the restaurants, this kind of thing. They basically were unskilled labor out of Hamburg doing the typical kinds of things that one would find in Hamburg. Unfortunately, the, uh, from the, the records we have, they have nothing about uh, their, pretty, very little about their pre 1933 activities. We don't know how many of these people in the working class had been labor union men, had been socialists, had been communists. Unless they volunteered this information uh, in a, on their own, it was not recorded in the interrogations. I should say a little bit about, about where this information comes from. This battalion was, uh, officers were put on trial in Hamburg in the late 1960s because it was a local unit, because they had the list of the personnel. Most of these people still lived in Hamburg. The investigating attorneys were, in fact, able to interrogate 212 of the men. This means that you have over 40% of the unit that you can talk to and interrogate. And this is a documentary base of a particular unit that really has no parallel that I've seen elsewhere. It's going to allow us, as I say, to, to get into the story of this battalion in a way that uh, is, is very unusual. But we can, of course, then recover previous employment, age, and all this kind of thing. About 40% were lower middle class. They were white-collar workers. The vast majority of this 40% of the clerks, of salesmen, uh, and this kind of thing. Most of them, in fact, were in sales of one kind or another. The average age was 39 years old. Over half of them were between 37 and 42 years old, so that they would be family men, and most of them would have children. Almost none of them had been in school beyond the age of 14 or 15. They had completed the German Volksschule. Some of them had had vocational training thereafter, but basically you're talking about uneducated, lower middle class, and working class Germans. Very few of them had any kind of political affiliation at all. Certainly, a very few of them were Nazi party members. These were the threats to society. The Nazis weren't particularly anxious that uh, these people be recruited in a significant way into the Nazi party. The question I wanted to ask above all was how does a unit like this 
become a murder unit. If one were looking at all the characteristics that should have been conducive to creating a murder unit, this was not the group we would have chosen. By geographical background, they came from one of the least occupied cities in Germany. By social background, the majority are working class, but presumably had more identity if they had any political identity. It was with socialist, communist, labor union, anti-Nazi political culture before 1933. They all came from an age group that was pre-Nazi. They had not been brought up under Nazi education. Their formative years were in a pre-Nazi period. Uh, there is no selection, there is no indoctrination. This is not just a random selection, this is in effect a selection on the basis of all the characteristics that should have made these people the poorest murder unit in Germany. The worst group that one could expect to be able to carry out these kinds of things. And so I ask myself, what happened when these people became murderers? How, what happened that first day? What is the personal experience of this unit when it is first told to shoot Jews. That first day, in fact, for most of the men, is tremendously memorable. And they talk about it. That, in fact, when it looks at the interrogations, the first day is the longest part, and then as it goes on and on and on, and ends into a horror in which they can't even keep the various events straight as the killing continues. But the first day is what sticks in their memory. And it's that day in particular that I would like to focus on now. The battalion is sent from Hamburg to the Lublin district in Poland in June of 1942. They arrive in late June. In early July, Commander Major Kopp apparently got word from the Bushnik in Lublin. We don't know the telephone call or the commentary came delivered the message. But basically, the first action this battalion is to face was as follows. The battalion was to concentrate and then scattered among various villages. They would come together, go to the village of Yuzefov, about 60 miles, I think, south of Jubin. There was a Jewish community of about 1,800. They would select out male Jews to be sent to a work camp in Jubin. All the women, children, elderly, frail, sick, were to be shot on the spot. There was no railway near this town. Uh, in fact, there were no trains available during a transportation shortage in early July when very few deportation trains were running in any case. This is the order that Major Trump gets. He calls together his officers, his captains and his tenants, and he tells them what has to be done. One lieutenant, a Hamburg businessman, he had a small lumber firm, a family firm, he changed the code. He doesn't remember the story exactly. He gives a of different versions. But he either said to the major or to the major's adjutant that he couldn't do it. He could not order his men to shoot defenseless women and children. They would have to find a different job for him. And they did. No problem. You can lead the guard the troops that will take the work Jews to the lead. You can leave before the shooting begins. No one followed his example. The only one, apparently, that asked for a different assignment. That evening, the men are told that they will be awakened in the middle of the night. They're given extra ammunition. So they know they're going into their first action, but they are not told what they're going to do. That they're simply going to be taken for an action that night. Around 2 in the morning, they are uh, awakened. They climb into the trucks, and the convoy of trucks drives from the barracks town of Bilgarai uh, to the town of Yuzefo. About four in the morning, just the sky is getting light, the trucks stop outside the village of Yuzefo, and, and the major now must tell the men what is going to happen. They don't know what they are to do. He assembles them in a kind of half circle around him, and virtually all the testimony is uh, agrees in this. Tears are streaming down his cheeks, to his cheeks. His uh, voice is breaking, he is struggling to control himself, and he gives them a short speech. He begins the speech by saying, we have a terrible, a frightful task to carry out. And I, in my own endeavor, have assigned this. These words come from the highest authority. Then he goes on to say, if it makes it any easier, you should keep in mind that the bombs are falling on women and children in Germany. That the Jews instigated the boycott against Germany. The 
Jews in this town, as he said, are in league with partisans. He gives a series of rationalizations. He then goes on to explain what this frightful task is, that they will go into the village, drive the Jews into the marketplace, select out the male Jews who will be taken away, and then they're going to have to shoot all the women, the children, and the elderly. At the end of that speech, they say, tears down his cheeks, his voice croaking, he then says, anyone who does not feel up to this, please step out. Apparently there was a pause, silence, and then one man from Third Company stepped out. Third Company was commanded by one of the SS captains. The SS captain was curious. He can screen at the man, to parade him, call him a coward. The major cut him off. He said, you heard what I said? He took the man under his protection. After which, about 10 or 12 other men stepped out after him, out of some nearly 500 men. They were allowed to turn in their rifles, so in fact they could not shoot their after. The major then calls his officers to him, gives them their assignments. Third company will form a cordon around the village. First and second companies will go into the village, drive the Jews out of their homes, take them to the marketplace. First company will then go to the forest, the firing squad, second company will load the Jews onto the trucks and they will be shuttled from the marketplace to the forest where they should be killed. Any Jew trying to escape is to be shot on the spot. Any Jew hiding, any Jew resisting, <coughs> any Jew sick, weak, frail, to move, to be shot, infants will be shot. It's not a slow process down. First and second battalions then moved into the town and began to drive the Jews out of the house. The town was filled with cries and shrieks, shots began to be fired. As best we can tell from the bulk of the testimony, the men drew at least one line at this point. They could shoot bedridden Jews to ill, but they did not get to shoot infants. Virtually all the accounts tell of the women with their infants being helped either to the marketplace, somebody else was going to have to shoot them, the policemen sent into the town. Uh, did not do it, nor did any officer intervene and order them to behave otherwise. As most of the Jews were collected at the marketplace, the first company is taken to the side. They have to be able to given a lesson in what they're going to do. No one in this company had ever been part of a firing squad. As far as I know, none of them had ever fired a shot at another human being, except those that were so old they were World War I veterans. There were some of those. The battalion doctor drew a figure on the ground and showed how if you mounted the bayonet on your right and you placed it at the top of the spine, the bottom between the shoulder blades, and pulled the trigger, you would induce instant death. And this is what he said would be the procedure that should be undertaken. The men were then, the first company was then sent to the woods. But again, they have no experience in how the procedure of organizing the firing squad should carried out. We know from the Einsatz group, and of course they tried to develop procedures that had the greatest depersonalization, the least contact with identity between shooter and victim. But these people didn't know it. They organized into two groups of 35, first company, basically the number of Jews that would be in a single truck. And as the trucks came out, the German policemen went up to the trucks, face to face, one on one, met their victims, marched them into the forest. The Jews were then forced to lie down in a row on the order of the sergeant. The men were to place the bayonet as they had been instructed and on the order to fire and pull the triggers. Uh, then they would go back down the path to the edge of the forest and get a new boat and take into the forest again. Sometime in the middle of the morning, apparently, supplies of alcohol were organized. Uh, and that uh, not only did one go back to the edge of the forest to get another victim, but also uh, to get a swallow of vodka uh, in order to be able to continue on uh, with this procedure. By late morning, it was clear to the officers that the procedure was going too slow. This was a very cumbersome process. People walking back and forth, one on one, so forth. They would have to have more shooters. And so second company was now Sign to shoot. Third company was called in from the court to take over the marketplace. Second company was taken to the side and told that they must.
Uh, in fact, most of them drank more than a great deal. Uh, the whole subject became a taboo. But not only that night, but in the weeks thereafter, no one talked about it. Uh, the men, they said almost uniformly, those that shot, as well as those that didn't, said the men were bitter, they were angry, they were resentful at what they had been asked to do. At this point, they didn't realize this was going to become repetitive. This was an isolated incident. They hadn't been told beforehand what this was about. It had been one day, and there was, in fact, a five-week period thereafter where they were not involved in killing, and they basically treated it as a kind of aberration, a day in which uh, they wanted to forget or repress as best they could, and it became simply a taboo to even mention What happened thereafter, however, well, well, I, I did one quote of one man, uh, I think he expressed the feelings of most of them, who said uh, that night, you know, if we had to try to do that again, I'd go crazy. Uh, and that is the initial attitude that most of these men had. In fact, what happens is that from late August through November, in fact, in December, this becomes a unit engaged in almost nonstop deportation and killing. Going from ghetto to ghetto, forcing Jews onto the death train Lingo, which were only about 90, 80, 90 miles north of where they were then stationed, or carrying out local executions when the trains were too full or the train stations were too far from the villages that they were supposed to clear from Jews. One lesson the Germans learned from this first day in Yosef, where the massacre had occurred, and that was that the policemen would do almost anything up to the point of shooting itself, and that was where the real Came. And so they developed a tactic of supplementing the police unit with men from property. And that the dirtiest of the work would be left to the property. The policemen would cordon the town, and it would be left to the Kalmyki people to go in, drive the Jews onto the trains, and carrying out what shootings might be necessary. It didn't always work that way, but that was the procedure they tried to adopt. And what was then possible for many of the men was to develop a kind of distancing to what was happening. They spoke after, after the first massacre to sit in the court and simply watch as the spectators as these things were taking place, uh, deprived of almost any sense of participation or responsibility. The uniform they sort of speak of the events, oh, I was only in the court, as if they had done nothing at all uh, in these other operations. Once they had gotten through that first massacre, nothing seemed quite uh, could match that, and therefore their sense of participation seemed to be vastly diluted. After the ghettos had been cleared, however, the battalion had another task. And that is, they had to keep their area Juden dry, to keep their district free of Jews. Many Jews had fled from the ghettos into the surrounding forest. And it now became the task of the battalion to track all of these people down, to kill them one by one as they were found find the bunkers and hiding place in the forest and to think of In this case, they set out patrol. The patrol became known quite simply as the Jew hunts, the Jew young. Went into the forest and hunted Jews as you would hunt rabbits or deer or anything else. This again put things back in a very personal perspective. You know, forming the cordons around ghettos and driving people on the train to be detached. Hunting individuals in the forest in a, in a, in a individual way simply could not be detached any longer. It became, once again, a quite personal confrontation and a quite personal killing process. But what had developed by this stage was, in fact, a kind of polarization within the unit. Those people that early on, particularly on the first day, had stepped out, had evaded, had quit because they could no longer continue, became, in a sense, the weaklings of the unit. They were not up to it, and they were more or less shoved aside. And those that had become tough, those that had become known, those that had degenerated into professional full-time killers who could do this in a routine way, then were basically left to carry out these kinds of patrols. As one man said, the officer only wanted men with them, and they didn't consider me a man, one who had not shot on the first day. And so that, once again, one generally didn't have to do these things. In fact, it wasn't even wanted to be there if you were not considered already a part of the uh, And thus, the last liquidations are carried out by those who have, in this period of, of 
first massacres of the ghetto period degenerated into really completely numb uh, and, and uh, hardened killers. In terms of those that, that did, those who in fact, well, in fact, let's say a little bit about both. How do they explain their behavior? What did they say about this later? For some who tried to deal with this, uh, they simply sort of threw up their hands and they said they, they, they lacked words to express it. It was as if they had been on a different political planet, a different political universe even, and that the 1960s simply didn't provide them with the vocabulary, the way to even explain what they had done and why they had done that 20 or 25 years earlier. A few of them that could uh, said the following. One man, for instance, said, well, at the time, I just didn't think anything about it. It wasn't until years later that it even occurred to me that what we had done had been wrong. Uh, another man said, quite frankly, I, when they asked us to step out, why did I not do that? I didn't want to be thought a coward. I couldn't do that in front of the man. He went on to say, once I tried to shoot, and then couldn't be longer, that was much different. I would be viewed in the eyes of my men in a very different way than if I had actually stepped out at the beginning and, and refused to play part of the killers. Those that, that other, others that didn't refer to very much more comfortable in referring not to kind of a moral position, but to heuristic reasons. Uh, the few people who were kind of economically independent, the Humber businessman, for instance, said, well, I, well, I had a business to go back to. I had no desire to stay in the place. I was not interested. Career, and then after giving this kind of banal career reasons, at the end says, and besides, in the line of my business, I have gotten to know many Jews. It gets down to really the human element of it all. Uh, these are not articulate people. Most of them, as I say, are very uneducated. They cannot put their actions in, cannot articulate them in abstract or physical ways, so that one has to, in a sense, dig out of the material. Uh, the kinds of motives that were operative at the time. Some of them made tremendous attempts at the time, in fact, to sort of rationalize what they were doing. The most extraordinary rationalization that came across was as follows. This was a man that admitted that he had shot all day, and he said as follows in the first day. I made the effort, and it was possible for me to shoot only children. It so happened that the mother led the children by the hand. My neighbor then shot the mother, and I shot the child with a long period because I reasoned with myself that after all, without his mother, the child did not live anymore. It was supposed to be, so to speak, soothing to my conscience to release children unable to live without their mothers. That has enough impact as it is, but if you read German and understand the term he uses for to release the child, it's Erdersen, which in German means not only to but also to redeem or save. Jesus is the redeemer, der Erlöser. Uh, so that, that double play uh, of the term Christian theology imposed in this context is an extraordinarily frightening kind of thing to come across. Uh, how does all of this add up? Basically, the experience of this battalion, I think, causes very grave problems for historians in terms of the kinds of explanations of human behavior that they have offered before. Uh, the kinds of explanations we've offered in the past, or at least certainly the explanation of almost all the perpetrators, was quite clearly. We had orders. If I didn't do this, I was going to suffer terrible consequences. <coughs> but we know, in fact, that this battalion, and demonstrated in the most graphic way on that first day that the offer was major, no one had to shoot. Not only did they not have to, they were invited by the major at the beginning, that if they could not do it, uh, they were welcome. Out. So that's the whole business of obedience to orders, binding orders, terrible consequences for violating orders, which is the stable explanation of almost every perpetrator that one finds interrogated after the war uh, simply does not hold water. Another explanation, of course, has been given that these people were propagandized, they were specially selected, indoctrinated, these were highly committed, ideologically motivated killers. That is not the case in this battalion. Some of the Einsatzgruppen commanders were exactly that. They took the elite of the ideological fanatics. But this was not the case with this group 
and in a sense incorporated the Jews, uh, that this reference, for instance, to the nation, that the bombs in are falling on the women and children in Germany, that therefore these villages are in fact part of the enemy and non combatancy is not an issue any longer. Uh, that the Polish Jews were simply not part of the community of human obligation with which these people had the enemy. It was more important how you were viewed in the eyes of your immediate comrades than how you viewed yourself vis-a-vis these others, these impersonal mass of foreign enemy Jews who you were going to shoot. One graphic example of this would be uh, one policeman who uh, had shot his first Jew, went back to the truck to get another Jew, and he relates as follows. After I carried out the first shooting, the unloading point was allotted a mother with daughter as victims for the next shooting, and I began a conversation with them. People talked to one another as they went through woods and learned that they were German from Kassel. I took the decision not to participate further in the executions. The entire business was now repugnant to me. I returned to my own platoon leader and told him I was sick and asked for my release. Polish Jews was one thing, but the German Jew didn't quite yet become the other. Someone from Kassel who spoke German, he was German, couldn't quite be disassociated from the community of human obligation as the foreign Jew could be. Uh, so that anti-Semitism plays a role, but it, it's a, it is not a kind of overt and clear role. It is the degree to which it eroded the sensitivities of the man, eroded their capacities for human empathy with another group, and allowed them, in effect, to treat this group as enemy as a foreign group with whom they have no kind of obligations. Uh, I might add just very briefly a little bit about what happens to these people. Uh, it's not a very happy story. The major, the one with the tears running down his cheeks, is extradited to Poland. Uh, he is tried and hung in Poland after the war, not because his battalion was involved ultimately in the killing of some 90,000 Jews, but because on one day he had shot 72 poles. That was the only count against him. The lieutenant, the Hamburg businessman who had said he couldn't order his men to shoot women and children, was also extradited to Poland and given eight years in prison. The two SS captains rose to high rank in the Hamburg police and had prosperous careers and felt they were finally uncovered in the late 1960s and very politely brought to trial and received sentences of roughly six years in prison. Uh, in terms of, of, of the unit, is the typical unit? Well, no. I don't know of any other example where a commander, in fact, invited his men not to take part. But the important thing here is that even with a commander such as this, even with a group of men selected from such an unconducive background, nonetheless, even this unit became a killer unit. If this unit
they are countries that we're not at war with, and they have lots of Germans living in those countries, and, and we don't want to get involved. But this is a list of countries, basically, that we can safely either take your Jews back to your country or turn them over to them. Uh, and putting pressure on these countries to declare disinterest in the Jews of their citizenship that were residing in Europe, in a sense, widening the net of people uh, who were going to be killed. And this could involve large numbers, 2,000 Turkish Jews in Paris, for instance, or Turkish Jews in Passport. So that anything that touched upon foreign affairs and involved final solution is across the best of these bureaucrats. And there's a wide variety of that. Yeah. I guess 25 years later, Very unhealthy way. But in general, my feeling. 
thing is that the unification of Germany is not ominous. I, I wouldn't necessarily call it progress, but it's not something that you keep your way Yes? At the beginning of your talk, in talking about the foreign office critic people, the low level groups, you mentioned that two of them wanted to get out. Do you have any feel for why these two particular bureaucrats did not want to stay in what was obviously a fairly cushy job? They even opted to go into, uh, into active warfare. Yeah, they basically said that they had a, they wouldn't admit that they knew the Jews were being killed because then all of the memoranda they had signed would make them accessories to murder. An accessory in German court has to be conscious. If you pay its own, if you say, all I knew is the Jews were being relocated, then you cannot be tried for accessory to murder unless they can prove your state of mind with other than It's very hard to prove the state of mind of somebody 20 or 30 years later. So these men would say on the one hand, it's quite contradictory. I didn't know anything bad was happening to Jews. Nonetheless, I had an uneasy feeling and didn't want to take part in this, and therefore I tried to get out. Well, in fact, they did know, of course, the Jews were being killed, and their response was they didn't want to do it, and if they could get out without damaging their personnel file, they would do it. But they wouldn't get up and say, this is impermissible, I won't take part in this one more minute, uh, and walk out of the room. Uh, they wanted to have it both ways. They wanted a clean record, and they wanted a new job. And the clean record had priority over the new job. Yes? Well, for the latter years of the war, we don't go to foresee a fall of Germany. Was there any war attempts or um, rejection of orders or such? No, what there is is a growing, and, and, and again, this is, um, I can quote the end of the, the, the major here, and he represents a, a not uncommon reaction to this. Uh, that I already mentioned he was crying at the beginning, and in fact, he all the way to say he was virtually weeping like a child throughout the entire day with his decision to kill him. Later said to his chauffeur, if this Jewish business, as he called it, is ever avenged on earth, have mercy on us Germans. In other words, Jews and Germans, if we lose the war, what will happen to us? There was an awareness at that point that they would they had crossed certain boundaries that if Germany didn't win the war now, something this they would be called to account. Uh, but they had they had breached they had, they had done the information. They had breached something that, that they basically were aware of. They, they, they knew well enough they committed a massive immorality. Uh, and there was that that reference then by a number of people, you know, heaven help us if we lose the war. Uh, that didn't lead to rejection, uh, as far as I know. That isn't a motive for people that said yes or no. Uh, that was a kind of retrospective look back after the killing had begun. Yes? You the cognitive experts that formed among bureaus like the Foreign Office, the Reichstag, et cetera, et cetera. Was that purely a survivalist instinct by these groups, or was that cognitively encouraged by such groups as the SS and the ISIS? Now, most of these preceded the Einsatzgruppen, and they preceded the, the involvement of the SS in Jewish policy. The SS had not become really involved in Jewish affairs until 1935-36. Most of these cadres and bureaucracy formed in 1933. They've never been on the ground floor before the SS. And it, it basically, I think, it's a matter of bureaucratic term. Their initial instinct is, this is now government policy. If somebody's making government policy, we have to have a piece of the action. We have to have our say. And that instinct to protect one's bureaucratic turf continues all the way up to the killing itself. I think we're being called 